All right, I'd like to welcome everyone to the morning session on uh, travel observation and um, population. And I'm just going to introduce everyone and then just turn it over to Ted and Joyce. Our first speaker will be Ted McCormick, who is Associate Professor of History at Concordia University. He is the author of William Petty and the Ambitions of Political Arithmetic, which was awarded the 2010 John Ben Snow Foundation Prize by the North American Conference on British Studies, and of numerous articles on early social science, natural philosophy, religion, government in the 17th and 18th century, Britain, Ireland, and the Atlantic, on the relationship between alchemy and economic ideas, and the history of scientific, economic, and political projecting. And he is currently writing a book on the role of demographic ideas in uh, religious and philosophical polemic in England and America between 16th and 1760. And his talk today is entitled Observations That Traveled, Grant's Observations and the Use of Quantification in Cotton Mather's New England. Our second speaker is Joyce Chaplin, who is James Duncan Phillips Professor of Early American History at Harvard. She is the author of An Anxious Pursuit, Agricultural Innovation and Modernity in the Lower South, 1730 to 1815, which won the Willie Lee Rose Book Prize from the Southern Association of Women Historians. Also of subject matter, Technology, the Body, and Science in the, on the Anglo-American Frontier, 1500 to 1676. The First Scientific American, Ben Franklin and the Pursuit of Genius, which was a winner of the ASEX Annabelle Jenkins Prize and a finalist for the LA Times Book Prize. And more recently, of Benjamin Franklin's Political Arithmetic, A Materialist View of Humanity, and Round About the Earth, Circumnavigation from Magellan to Orbit. And her talk today is entitled T.R. Malthus, Travel Literature and the World's Population. So let me turn it Well, thank you very much for that introduction, and thanks to Dan and Eileen for having me here. Speak a little louder. Sure. I just wanted to thank Dan and Eileen for inviting me to this conference, and thanks, uh, Lynn, for that introduction. <clears throat> On the 21st of August, 1708, Ezekiel Cheever, headmaster for 38 years of the free school in Boston, Massachusetts, died. He was 94. Cotton Mather, one of Cheever's former students, delivered the funeral sermon. His theme was the shortness of human life. In a particularly striking passage, he addressed himself to, in the language of numbers to the crop of young scholars Cheever left behind. Children, he instructed, go into the burying place. There you will see many a grave shorter than yourselves. Tis now upon computation found that more than half the children of men die before they come to be 17 years of age. And what needs any more be said, he concluded, for your awakening to learn the holy scriptures. Four years later, as an epidemic ravaged the neighboring colony of Connecticut, Mather offered some seasonable thoughts upon mortality to his flock. His text was Job chapter 24, verse 19. Drought and heat consume the snow waters, so doth the grave those that have sinned. His doctrine was the inexorable nature of death, and his argument again took him from the elegant similitude of his text to the cold, hard statistics of political arithmetic. The extent of mortality is universal. They that have made nice remarks on bills of mortality will tell you that one half of those that are born don't live 17 years that but about 40 of 100 are found alive at 16, that but 10 of 100 at 46, but 6 at 56, but 3 at 66, but 1 at 76. Were there as many nations as we are now entertained with snowdrifts, or as many persons as we can see flakes of snow, death, death will quickly melt them all away. The empire of death, as Mather put it, is a universal monarchy. A third and for now final example comes from Mather's funeral sermon for Mrs. Uh, Mehetable Garish, who died in November 1715, aged 21. This text also came from the book of Job, chapter 7, verse 6, now likening the passage of life to the flying of the weaver's shuttle. Elaborating his argument, Mather cited the psalmist's dictum, Psalm 90, verse 10, that the days of our years are threescore years and ten. He enjoined his parishioners to form a computation for themselves of how few among them would reach that mark. More than half the children of men, he reminded them, fall so short of 70 that it is affirmed they die short of 17. Indeed, he averred, if the clerks of our trained companies would bring in their lists and compare them with those of just 20 years earlier, the lists would be very little other than so many bills of mortality. The source of Mather's demographic knowledge was, in fact, John Grant's 1662 Natural and Political Observations on the Bills of Mortality. 
By applying a tradesman's shop arithmetic to London's weekly mortality bills, Grant had, among much else, constructed a rudimentary table of life expectancy, according to which mortality rates remained roughly constant at every age from 6 to 76. The result, as Mather faithfully reported, was that of 100 live births, only about 64 would survive to 6 years of age, 40 to 16, and so on. But why should Grant's quantitative observations of demographic patterns in London have found their way into funeral sermons on the other side of the Atlantic, and how did their travel affect their significance? The late 17th century construction of population as an object of empirical observation and mathematical analysis is well known. Scholars have implicated it in the evolution of social science and statistics, the rise of centralized fiscal bureaucracy, the elaboration of biopolitical governmentality, and the formation of quantitative secular worldviews. As the historical literature moves from the 18th to the 19th century, quantification connotes increasingly accurate, precise, and empowering, even overpowering information, an avalanche of printed numbers, in Hacking's phrase. Contestation arose over essentially novel issues of control, access, and representation. Who was counted and how? Who saw the numbers and who decided their scientific or social import? In light of their New England sojourn, however, Grant's numbers raise other questions. What did statistics mean without a bureaucratic state? What did London's mortality trends tell audiences in small town Massachusetts? What did the recitation of a life table communicate, not in a metropolitan insurance office, but from a pulpit on the colonial frontier? What, in short, was the framework within which Mather's public reading of political arithmetic made sense? In pursuing this problem, I will argue that Mather's use of Grant and other political arithmeticians throws into relief aspects of early demographic quantification that more familiar metropolitan foci tend to obscure, not least the very multiplicity of contexts, purposes, and audiences for demographic thought. Cotton Mather is infamous for his role in the Salem witch trials. He's also reasonably well known as a scientific enthusiast and an early American fellow of the Royal Society who communicated colonial curiosities a large skeleton found in Virginia, a cure for rattlesnake bites, a live lizard vomited by a man in Newbury, to bemused metropolitan correspondents. His more positive contribution to the advancement of learning was his dogged support for smallpox inoculation during the Boston epidemic of 1721. This involved him in anecdotal data collection on the survival of the inoculated, but nothing comparable, for example, to what his correspondent James Durin undertook after the London outbreak of the next years. He was a dabbler. Quantification, meanwhile, is thought to have had a bad press among the godly in England and New England alike. According to 2 Samuel chapter 24, verses 1 through 10, King David had sinned in seeking to know the number of the people. All Israel had suffered pestilence as punishment. In the context of a society anxious about the decline of piety and predisposed to view public affairs in a providential light, tendencies given a powerful fillip by the troubling events of the 1670s and 80s, few were likely to meddle in such perilous matters. Historians of American demographic thought blame anxiety about David's sinful census for political arithmetic's slowness to catch on in secular contexts. As late as 1841, indeed, it's alleged as a cause of resistance to the census in Britain itself. These fears were no doubt real. Their inhibiting effect on demographic thinking, however, may be exaggerated. Mather, for example, tackled the supposed sin of David head on in a 1696 election sermon, which incidentally appears to predate his use of Grant, although I can't be sure about that. He agreed that when David numbered the people, there was a great sin cleaving to that matter. But he insisted that God's quarrel had been with Israel as a whole for their former iniquities. Under the circumstances obtaining in David's day, the census had acted as a trigger for God's accumulated wrath. But in itself, it was not a sin simply to number the people. By implication, there could be no harm in numbering them now. One reason for doing so was precisely to verify providential readings of events. In Cotton's father, Increase Mather's brief history of King Philip's War, whose purpose, like Grant's, was to methodize scattered observations, striking numbers signified divine displeasure or less often approbation. Just as God had menaced Jerusalem with desolation, so he threatened to leave New England without an English inhabitant. And now the elder Mather insisted, all these things have been verified upon us. Is it nothing that so many have been cut off by a bloody and barbarous sword? Is it nothing that widows and fatherless have been multiplied among us? A similar language of the multiplication of types marked English economic writing prior to Grant, for example, an anxiety over the multiplication of beggars through enclosure. In both contexts, even vague numbers had definite moral import. 
Cotton Mather, for his part, used numbers as a providential hermeneutic before and after encountering statistical observations in the form of uh, Grant's book. Demonstrating in 1696 the imminence of the kingdom of God, he cited both the destruction of thousands of Protestant churches in Europe and the havoc made by epidemical sicknesses and mortal contagions in New England. A thousand persons, if I have not misreckoned, have been from one town in one year carried onto their eternal home. Sixteen years on, having read Grant, he took the multiplication of funerals in Connecticut as a call to the living, <coughs> highlighting the mortality consuming of our neighbors so that there may be made a very holy improvement of it. This improvement required observation and analysis. The prevalence of death among the useful and the young, for instance, constituted an injunction to do good while one was able. Death is not so mute, Mather concluded, but that it speaks unto the living. And then death so multiplied speaks with a very loud voice unto us all. Grant's numbers did not introduce Mather to population, but they did give his providentialism a naturalistic ring, shifting the epistemic focus from marvelous figures to the universal laws and patterns the life table described. These laws were both an aspect of nature's economy and a divine response to Adam's fall. Our first parent had no sooner tasted of the forbidden fruit, Mather said, but that box was opened out of which all deadly plagues have issued. Man becomes mortal, and no man, save two or three miracles, has escaped the common law of mortality. Demographic law, its causes obscure but its effects plain to see, was the yardstick against which deviations must be judged. Some might be miracles, others assuredly were not. If sometimes death is hastened upon special sinners, by the same token, some sins naturally quicken the pace of death. Specific deaths might have meaning, but the pattern of mortality was the key. <clears throat> Imported knowledge of demographic patterns illuminated current events in the colonies and across the world. It also shed light on the entire history of salvation from the scriptural past to the millennial future. In a 1715 sermon, Mather insisted that the providence of God marvelously at work in every generation, preserving the world from generation to generation, calls for our observation. Drawing now on William Petty's estimates of the doubling periods governing global population growth, which Mather would have encountered in William Whiston's New Theory of the Earth, if not more directly, he noted that learned men have, by exquisite computations, rendered it probable that mankind grows double to what it was in less than 400 years. Not only did such steady growth support scriptural chronology, like the balanced proportion of the sexes which Grant had seen as an argument for monogamy, it also bore witness to God's ongoing solicitude. At times, finally, demographic calculation functioned not just to coordinate sacred and secular history, but also to flesh out scripture, sometimes in surprising ways. Explicating a passage from the Book of Numbers, Mather imagined Moses' spies in Canaan as early political arithmeticians, measuring the land's salubrity by its mortality. He wrote, the spies brought up, by that bad, brought up that bad report of the good land, Numbers 1332. It is a land that eats up the inhabitants thereof, in his gloss. Probably they saw many funerals while they were spying the land, and they concluded the air of the land so bad it could be no healthy country. The massive Biblia Americana, Mather's ten-volume manuscript biblical commentary, derived estimates of Israel's population in the book of Genesis using modern demographic ratios taken from Petty and Nehemiah Grew. Even when speculating about the world to come, Mather trawled chronologists' calculations to make the point that the inhabitants of the new earth will be greatly and quickly multiplied. Though in paradise, at least, he thought, not much arithmetic would be needed. <laughs> Among Puritans, Mather's interest in population was unusual, though not unique. The providential and sacred historical uses he found for political arithmetic, meanwhile, marked its reception in England as well especially among the sort of latitudinarian authors then making headway among readers at Harvard. William Durham's popular physico-theology followed Grant in drawing religious instruction from the sex ratio. Durham and his fellow Boyle lecturer Richard Bentley saw steady population growth as evidence of divine management. Following Grant and Petty, Edward Stillingfleet, Matthew Hale, Bentley, Whiston, and later Newton all applied modern demographic observations to biblical chronology, not always for the same purposes. Mather's adoption of political arithmetic highlights its less secular applications and reflects the transatlantic appeal of a latitudinarian strategy for combating skepticism, pre-atomism, and deism. But Mather did more than regurgitate English ideas in an American setting. He added work of his own. This is most obvious in his letters to the Royal Society, known as the Curiosa Americana. 
Historians of natural history have regarded these in comparison with the systematic queries favored by the Royal Society as credulous, text-bound, and archaic relations of marvelous singularities. If one asks not what Mather contributed to a London research program, however, but how he related metropolitan developments to his own interests, the picture changes. Mather's discussion of Mather's demographic, old-fashioned as it often was, revealed the capacity of the newest quantitative demographic knowledge to map relations between colony and metropole, past and future. The Curiosa Americana drew on Mather's reading and contacts, as well as on the work of the defunct Boston Philosophical Society, and began with a batch of letters to John Woodard and Richard Waller, then secretary of the Royal Society, in late 1712. A selection printed in the Philosophical Transactions two years later captures the flavor both of Mather's offerings and of their reception. One letter dealt with fossil evidence of antediluvian giants, another containing nothing very observable in the editor's judgment with monstrous births, another with sick men who dreamed of cures for their ailments. These accounts relate little to natural philosophy. Another with miraculous recoveries, little of philosophical information here. But the last letter, summarized in some detail and without noticeable editorial hedging, dealt with the history of population. Mather's point of departure was common ground with latitudinarians and indeed with several political arithmeticians, including Grant and Petty, the rational defense of scriptural chronology and history. When you are confuting the caviling pre-Adamites and confounding the cavils which your deists raise against the Earth's rapid peopling, he began, I observe you make, a very moderate, uh, you make very moderate allowances for the quick progression of mankind into a multitude. As English authors from Stillingfleet through Whiston had done, Mather sifted earlier chronologists' claims about the size and growth of biblical populations. He found that given ancient longevity, even comparatively restrained assumptions about fertility meant that one family would long before the flood have afforded many more than twice the number of people that are now living on the earth. Neither Cain's persecution, nor the universality of the flood, nor implicitly the quick emergence of cities and empires thereafter, each of which required rapid multiplication, need be doubted. So far, this was conventional, even derivative, but Mather then brought colonial experience to bear on the question. But now, he wrote, how prodigious would be the increase of mankind in these terms if you should insist upon such a fruitfulness as that by which many of my good countrywomen have been signalized. Colonial example could put orthodox minds at ease. It is no rare thing, he wrote, for an aged gentlewoman here to see many more than a hundred of her offspring before she leave the world. Mather cited numerous instances of considerable fertilities, some at first hand. A woman named Bent, pregnant with her 27th child, a Maury with 23 children, a Wharton with 22, Another woman known via New England Governor William Phipps, himself one of 26, to have had 39. The philosophical transactions noted the numbers, but interestingly left out the names. This may sound a little like the credulous retailing of marvels, but Mather noted several European instances of almost preternaturally fertile marriages that far outstripped his American examples, at least as to sheer number, as many as 53 children in one German case. His point seems rather to have been that considerable fertilities of a somewhat lesser magnitude were no rare thing in the colonies, and that this fact shed light on both the probable shape of biblical demography and the peculiarity of modern patterns as observed by Grant and others. He wrote, if such a polytoky were attended with a longevity like that of the first ages, mankind would not require near 400 years, as you tell us it now does, to double itself. But alas, you inform us that but 64 out of 100 of the children that are born are alive at six years old, but 40 of 100 alive at 16 years end, but three out of 100 at 60, I think he means 66 there, and but one out of 100 at 76. Grant's life table, the picture of a prototypically modern population, now appeared not as a warning to repent, but instead as a measure of humanity's distance from the first ages of the earth. Colonial fertility, by contrast, was a reminder, if not positively a vestige, of the demographic order that had obtained throughout the antediluvian world, and a key to the intellectual recovery of that world. Mather next turned to the second factor in biblical doubling, longevity. Here, too, he connected scripture, contrasted with the metropolitan demographic economy Grant described, to colonial example. Having quoted Grant's table, he noted reports of modern Europeans who had vastly ex exceeded the stated period of threescore years and ten. But he then, again, offered examples of New Englanders whose longevity was more modest, but also in a colonial context less unusual. We cannot show, he wrote, as Johannes de Tempore nor such a person as Pereskius too shows, to be 400 years old. 
but we have had several that have lived above 100, and some now living are much older than the country in which I am now writing, the planning whereof began a little after the beginning of the former century. Among these long livers were Mather's 112-year-old neighbor, Boniface Burton, a woman named Moore, who was 12 years of age when King Charles I came to the throne, a Richard Everett of Dedham, who died in 1682 at the age of 108, and one Clement Weaver of Rhode Island, the only one whose name made it into the philosophical transactions, I have no idea why, who lived to 110, whose wife passed 100, and whose offspring Mather had seen to the fifth generation. As the printed extract in the transactions noted, I do not find by any of these relations that the persons observed any regularity or method in their manner of diet, exercise, or the like. Yet New England apparently produced many such persons. These were providences, certainly. But not all providences were marvelous. Before the census, where individual fecundity and longevity were concerned, anecdotal data were important, were indeed the norm. Singular instances might contravene the natural order, or they might provide clues to it. Pondering the natural causes of antediluvian longevity in his letter to the Royal Society and in later sermons, Mather criticized natural historians, ancient and modern, for their improbable hypotheses. All that can be said for it is that the great God hath ordered it. Yet he also distinguished between the role of providence in individual fates and the historically specific demographic economies, the common experiences of fertility and longevity, great in the biblical world and attenuated in the present, in terms of which those fates should be interpreted. In setting numerous instances of colonial fertility and longevity against greater but rarer European prodigies on the one hand and the modern standard of the life table on the other, Mather effectively positioned colonial demographic experience somewhere between the ordinary and the miraculous, or between the metropolitan present and the scriptural past. One point on which Mather, early political arithmeticians, and their latitudinarian and natural philosophical re readers uh, mostly agreed, was that God governed the growth and structure of populations for benevolent purposes. Durham's physico-theology, itself seen by later political arithmeticians as part of their canon, laid this out with care. And Mather's highly derivative Christian philosopher, printed in London in 1721, asserted that even the numbers of insects and vermin were adjusted to di by divine arrangement to human needs. Another widely shared idea was that across time and space, moral, physical, and demographic economies were interrelated in both their nature and their dynamics. Death itself was a response to sin. The gradual abridgment of human longevity in the wake of the flood, effected through or reflected in environmental changes, was a response to antediluvian pride. Each new famine, fire, or epidemic was an invitation to reflect and repent for collective misdeeds. Thinking about population, in short, meant thinking about government. Studies of biopolitics have made this observation trite, but they've also made it two-dimensional. One facet of a process of bureaucratic state formation predicated on the secularization of a pastoral power once vested in the church. Mather's engagement with political arithmetic, by contrast, put statistics in the hands of an angry god, ruling over a community of wayward saints. In this setting, the very power of numbers was itself a function of, the divine, of divine goodwill. As the active colony of Ephraimites had learned to their cost in Psalm 78, and as more than one colonial army found in battle with numerically inferior French or Indian foes. They reckoned themselves numerous and powerful enough to attack the Canaanites in their own country, but they came off unhappy losers in it because they kept not the covenant of God. As Mather's otherwise bizarre graveside rendition of Grant's life table indicates, the authority, or rather the responsibility, for interpreting to the community the providential messages that demographic numbers bore, the duties they imposed, belonged here to the pastor. Mather's example seems to cast the relationship between demographic quantification and government in an archaic light. This impression may be salutary, but it needs unpacking. Mather's combination of spiritual and intellectual authority and of ecclesiastical and political roles, and hence the range of circumstances in which he brought Grant's and others' observations to bear, reflected his particular colonial situation. It's difficult to imagine the average Anglican parish priest rattling off a list of death rates in the midst of a service. In this sense, Mather's example suggests some of the ways in which travel changed even seemingly fixed observations. The social and geographical circulation of even the merest scraps of demographic knowledge, such as Grant's tentative life table, could extend the power and condition the meaning of numbers in complex and quite radical ways. Yet there's perhaps another sense in which Mather's example concentrates and clarifies in one person relations that may also have been present, perhaps in different configurations elsewhere. 
Throughout much of the British world, though not as it happens in Massachusetts, churches remained the major gatherers and repositories of vital data well into the 19th century. Despite their privileged access, however, and their contribution to secular debates about population, the distinctive and distinctively public role of clergymen as interpreters of this data has been little explored. Yet the same parish registers that went into life tables were also documentary records of morally significant individual and communal decisions and events. Juxtaposing colonial anecdotes with metropolitan patterns, Mather apparently thought it his business as pastor to connect these two aspects of demographic experience, thereby to methodize and improve scattered observations for private and public application. William Petty, inventor of political arithmetic and author of several papers on the scientific potential of the Anglican parish clergy, would have agreed. It is perhaps in the light of this same pastoral duty, finally, that we should see Mather's later support of smallpox inoculation. As with census taking in relation to the sin of David, so with medical interventions in relation to God's providence, religion tends to be construed as a barrier to be overcome by empirical evidence or bypassed for reasons of state. Mather's correspondence with Jurin suggests a different picture. In how many of your towns, he wrote, have one in three or four died that have been taken with it, that is smallpox? In your capital city, how has it grown upon you till many more than a hundred a week die of it, and the dead by it make a seventh part of those that fill your bills of mortality? The scale of the plague was measured by the numbers of the dead. But similar numbers, at least for Mather, verified the providential legitimacy of inoculation. 10,000 more have lost their lives, he wrote, by medicines freely taken even in health than through inoculation, which had been tested on several, more than one or two, hundreds of persons of all kinds. Yet the physicians of Boston would rather see above 1,000 of their neighbors within a few months killed than use a method that would have saved them. To learn from numbers was to heed providence. To ignore them was to tempt God. Thank you. Well, we have some time for questions. Um, I wanted to open it up to the audience. Sarika. I have a question for Joyce. Um, I wonder if you might say a bit more about um, the source, the more recent sources that Malthus didn't use. I mean, do we know much about things that he owned, things that he read, that, and what kinds of data they had? Um, you know, a little more about the rationale for what he didn't um, use for evidence. I don't know if you can establish a rationale for what he didn't use. Um, there's one great problem in trying to figure that out. There's a collection of, there's a Malthus library at Cambridge, um, but it appears to have belonged to his father and several other members of the family, and it's hard to identify the volumes with him. It doesn't appear that, some of the books are marked in, but not in a way that you can determine in his own hand. Um, good luck to anyone who tries to uh, establish uh, what possibly is in the library that it could have been something he read. That would be almost impossible to do, I think. Um, the only thing that I can think of doing is to point out things that he didn't cite that were well known at the time. Um, so for example, I'm struck by the fact that he missed William Bartram, um, who was widely read um, at this period of time, and who remarked on um, the, the larger Indian nations in uh, the southeast part of North America. Malthus's vision of, of um, the Americas is of a place where Indian populations are thin and dwindling. And by not picking up someone like Bartram, um, he's missing uh, a, a kind of counter source that would have questioned um, his conclusion in that regard that we know a lot of people read. So it's, it's doing work like that to say that um, he had missed um, something that was under more general uh, conversation at the time. But it's hit or miss, frankly. Mm -hmm. Um, one thing uh, that I think uh, could be done, however, he does add things in later editions. Sometimes they themselves are odd. Um, so even though for him the Americas really means North America, he later adds um, um, Humboldt, sorry, <laughs> too obvious. Uh, so he adds Humboldt. Um, I can't remember which edition, but eventually it gets in there. So he is keeping up with some things. They don't always match, though, again, the kind of analytic um, statements that he's making. Carl? So also a question for Joyce. Uh, so I was curious about the reception of uh, the incorporation of these, uh, these, these global stories and, and global evidence. 
Do, do you see a change in the way that his work was being read and discussed uh, from the first edition to the second editions? And does he seem like, in, in, in subsequent letters of conversation, does it seem like he su su succeeded in his own mind in making his point more clear and more convincing? Mm. Um, we're just beginning to figure that out. Um, and actually, we haven't quite decided how broadly we want to define the reception. Um, um, certainly, we're, I'm interested in the reception within the United States, um, where it's difficult to figure out, um, because in some ways, because Malthus is relying on Franklin, um, Franklin's story gets circulated first, and it's not exactly the same as Malthus. So reception of Malthus is in some sense conditioned in the United States by the assumption people had um, that the settler population was increasing very rapidly um, and that the, the native population was destined to disappear, which is not Malthus's conclusion. Um, very interestingly, uh, that his, uh, he sets up another kind of moral hazard by saying that, look, if the principal population is universal, settlers are going to run out of resources anyway. Why commit the ethical um, outrage along the way of taking resources away from the indigenous population? I don't think there was much receptivity to that argument in the United States. <laughs> so that's something that is going to be a point that I, th I think it's going to be sadly easy to establish uh, in terms of the reception. Within England, um, it does seem that un that the story about the poor laws is dominant. That's how people see him, um, as far as we can initially tell. So there are some responses to the expanded um, second edition, um, many of which just go back to the old argument, um, and they don't care um, that there is this longer geography. There's one interesting newspaper account that says this is all common knowledge and why he had to spend that many pages on it um, is sort of puzzling, which is interesting, um, that he was using sources so familiar in a way and so um, perhaps well-established, if not elderly. Um, people didn't know why he, he went on and on about it. Um, one of the most interesting responses, I'm just finally reading William Godwin's response. Everyone forgets that he, he went back in. He didn't give up. Um, and he writes a very extended and somewhat peevish um, account, um, but arguing, I think in some ways, he had the most technical response. He looks at the American census, the US census. He looks at Morse, uh, the Gazetteer. He goes back to analyze, um, in some sense, who was Franklin, what was he talking about? That's the interesting one, though it's such an odd response, I don't really have a considered conclusion about it. So sorry about that. I, it's sitting there on my table um, with many notes taken out of it. But we'll see. Dan? I have, uh, a, I have a list now. So no, no, no. <laughs> Dan and then Ann. I'll try to talk fast. Um, thank you very much, Paul, for a great session. Uh, a question for, for Ted. There were so many interesting issues that that, that, that raised. One of which was I, I was sort of made me think a little bit more about the category of, of, of the miraculous. And I wondered why you wouldn't admit the fact that somebody lives to the age of 76 as being a miracle. I mean, according to the statistics which have been provided, mm. it's actually a defiance of mm. probability in some ways that anyone should survive to this age. So I'm just curious about how it fits into a mentality that, that might is both engaged what? by miracles and yet is also not at the same time. I guess I would I'd flip that around and say, it's interesting that sometimes the life table is the law, and other times the life table is a European thing. So when he's talking to his, you know, he's talking to people at a funeral, well, you know, 21 doesn't seem great, but it's actually pretty good innings if you think about you know, how many people have gone at 17. And 94, well, that's just crazy. But, um, but then when he's writing to the Royal Society, he says, you tell us this. You tell us that the population takes this long. So you tell us that you know, 64 of 100 are, are dead by 17. Um, so I think there's, depending on the audience, the, 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 the meaning of, of the law shifts a little bit. I mean, I don't think that he's, he doesn't have a naive reading of it where it's impossible that someone makes it past 76. I mean, it's unusual. It's improbable. And he has, you know, he's, he's capable of using that language. But 
it serves a very different moral purpose in the context of his parish than it does when he's talking transatlantically to people and when he's, and when he's sort of locating the colonies um, as demographically interesting, as demographically different. I mean, what I didn't get into, and which I, I don't actually know how quite to get into at this point, is that when he's talking about these individual cases of long-lived people in particular, he'll say, you know, so-and-so you know, didn't have any particular diet that he followed. Or if there's something unusual or something remarkable, it could, it could be almost anything. Um, you know, the, the two uh, centenarians who were married to each other, they had a very good marriage. They always ate from the same trencher. They were, you know, that seemed, that's a relevant point. But, you know, in the next case, you have someone who made it to 104 and was a pretty terrible person the whole way. So, um, but he's at least asking those questions. What's, what I've noticed only, I haven't really thought much about yet, is that all those attempts to look for, for, for specific causes of individual cases disappear in the philosophical transactions. It's just numbers. And there's, the no, there's a notation, basically, that you know, no, in none of this does there seem to be any particular cause, which leaves you with there's something interesting about New England, right? There's something, maybe there's something about the territory, which is one thing that he doesn't ask about. But it is something that Petty, in, in a basically similar context, was very much concerned. So I think that I mean that that point could probably be pushed further, although whether it can be pushed further on the basis of, of what Mather alone has to say, I'm, I'm really doubtful. Yeah. Thanks so much. Um, so I wanted to ask about Joyce's methodology of uh, averaging publication dates and mm. what the numbers would look like in Pitt's case, and also wondering. Um, so what does this tell us about the speed of circulation of knowledge, and what mm -hmm. intermediate stages are there? Where is there conversation, travel, people? And then journals recycling things that may be intermediate sources from which either of these people are inspired to consult the original or to not consult the original, but cite it even if they get it from an uh, intermediate source. And so, a general question about mm -hmm. But I thought it was great. Have you seen other people? No, no. And I was hoping other people would tell me other people had done that. <laughs> no, no, I don't think so. It's great. But it does pose all kinds of questions about, you know, what are the difficulties really of, so you went back and found first edition dates and average dates. Yes. Um, looking, I mean, I did pay some attention to the version that Malthus used and, and the earliest version of that, if you see what I mean, the earliest edition of that version. Um, and I, I would like to go back and check those again very, very carefully. Um, um, I mean, the thing, oh, um, it, it did turn out to be interesting. I mean, I thought of doing this because as I was reading him, I thought, wow, I, I, could, I can't believe Lafitau has this long life. And then I noticed there were a lot of these old guys. Um, and so um, that's why I started to figure out why that was a database that looks so old and why there weren't these newer things like Bartram, for instance. I mean, that, that newer things like Bartram were not there. But the thing is, I think the, the, the discouraging thing now is that it should probably be done for the whole book to look at the different regions. I mean, we really only wanted this to be a book about America, um, but I think the Comparand internally would be the place to start. Um, um, in terms of the circulation, um, oh, I'm sorry. No, Nick desperately wants to. <laughs> it would only make sense if you could also get a normal figure for the same period. I don't find it surprising that someone, I don't know the 1790s as well as other people, but it seems totally normal to me that those names come up. So I don't, and that's just based on a kind of instinct of what I think people are reading. And so I, I just saw the list and thought, yeah, that's what you're going to, that's the best available. That's what the library okay. is. Okay, let That's me talk it. about the two really lousy things on his reading list, where he really should have had a sixth sense and not included that kind of material. Um, so one is the Major Rogers. Let me see if I can go back to, yeah, Rogers, 1765. This guy was a professional liar, right? So he's an adventurer. He was a hero of the French and Indian War. He writes this account. Then he completely disgraces himself during the American Revolution. He's caught carrying a portfolio of every kind of letter of introduction and pass. And later on, says that he'll sell himself to either side. Um, the last evidence we have of Major Rogers is a 
passport on a dead body. You know, by he was discredited during his lifetime as an adventure of the worst kind. So why is this their cred, uh, uh, kind of credibility thing? And then there's the Hawksworth, which at the time was reviewed and completely rejected by the participants. Banks was furious. Cook was furious. It's widely reviewed as nonsense, an invention of the author. So yes, um, I may not, the dates are not the full story. Um, but I think the dates plus this sort of odd assemblage, including stuff that had been questioned and notoriously, um, makes me wonder what this reading represents. Just a very quick footnote. I mean, I mean Locke is a similar pattern, okay, a century earlier, but Locke is quoting stuff from the 1530s and treating it as if it's absolutely as relevant as something that appears the, the, the day before. Mm -hmm. So certainly, if you, that's, I don't think it's out of, out of the bounds of normal practice. But it's like Pope de Mure, it's like in the absence of better things, you use what you have. Mm -hmm. You don't necessarily think it's the best thing, it's just that you take what there is. But okay. this isn't what there is. Yeah. By, 18, uh, by 1800. It's not what there is. And the problem is, as well, um, in his account of the, of the Americas, um, Malthus tends to use the past tense. In his account of Australia, he uses the present tense. So in some ways, he knows that he's using this older stuff that doesn't necessarily describe what the Americas are like now whereas he's using materials that do describe what Australia is like closer. So yeah, so it's not just the dates um, that make me wonder what he's doing. Cameron and then one. Yeah, this is for either or both of you. Um, I was wondering if there's any effort to account for African slavery in any of these mm. uh, population estimates, either whether Cotton Mather you know, had an eye on uh, Barbados or South Carolina. It, it might be a little early for that. I, I'm not sure. Um, and for Joyce, whether yeah, as they do start to, at least some of the traveler accounts there, I know, into the Caribbean, um, I don't know all of them. But whether this figured into his calculations at all, either in terms of you know, lifespan or uh, sort of really sort of calculations about how populations should move and settle, whether this you know, emptying of Africa or the filling up of the new world with, with Africans, whether this is seen mm -hmm. in a way, bad way at all. Mm -hmm. um, in Mather's case, no. Uh, there is some comment on uh, Native American numbers, and there's this sort of knowledge, which is not by any stretch unique to him, nor does it post-date his encounter with Grant, uh, that there had been a precipitous decline in, in numbers even prior to settlement. And this is interpreted, as one would expect, as a sort of providential judgment in clearing of space. Um, Petty is interested in New English numbers uh, in the 70s after King Philip's War, and he interviews apparently a couple of um, visitors to London from New England. And in some of his notes, there is some reference made to numbers of slaves in particular communities, but it's totally a, a systematic. And he never does anything much with, with it in terms of numbers at all, um, nor actually does he do much with those notes. So the short answer is no. I think that changes certainly, well, I mean, it, it, by the next generation, I think that's changing, but it matter, not that I've seen. Um, it is a very odd feature um, of the 1803 Malthus, and um, that although he adds the Americas, he leaves out the West Indies. <laughs> well, he does. I mean, Bruce and Valiant our accounts of Africa. Um, and he's talking about uh, slavery going to the Americas. Um, but he leaves out, from the British perspective, it, um, circa you know, uh, 1803, the place that really should be there. Um, and it's not. It's just, it's just not, there's no mention. So slavery is mentioned in relation to the continental um, phenomena. And not even really, it's, it's uh, in some sense, really relying on Franklin's um, assessment of slavery on the continent, um, echoing Franklin's warning that uh, the continent should not resemble. Um, the whole point was to make sure that the continent never resembled the West Indies, but without having the West Indies there in the account. Um, in a later edition, um, Malthus has a kind of extended footnote um, 
on uh, the slave trade um, that is in some sense an afterthought. Uh, so I, I haven't got, I don't know why he decided to put it in and to put it in there, um, but it really isn't as present probably as it should have been for an assessment of uh, what overseas populations were like and what imperialism did to them. It's a, it's a notable gap. Sorry, just a quick PS to that. I should say um, Africans do come up in uh, Mather's defense of smallpox in population, mm. oh, which right. he hears about from uh, a slave. And in defending it, he invokes their numbers as support for their testimony. On, in, in behalf of inoculation. So he says, there is at this time a considerable number of Africans in this town who can have no conspiracy or combination to cheat us. Nobody has instructed them to tell their story. The more plainly, brokenly, and blunderingly, and like idiots they tell their story, it will be with reasonable men the more credible. So it's interesting, although it's not quite what you were asking. Okay. Uh, question for Joyce and Ted. For Joyce, uh, it seems like a very curious uh, global essay he's writing when the, the India appears only with Asiatic researchers. Um, I'm sorry, this is, these are only for the parts of the essay that talk about the New Worlds. So he has later sections that so talk about China you, and... What are you doing with China and India? How I don't that? know. <laughs> <laughs> I have not looked at it with any, the same kind of care. So no, really I can't make that kind of comparison. And, and for, for Ted, the, the, the uh, I mean I found the Biblical exegesis is fascinating with this use of, uh, of political arithmetic for, for uh, as a means to uh, do biblical hermeneutics of numbers and David and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, but also the presentation of New England as this kind of uh, 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 antediluvian space or something, uh, pre prior to the generation, prior to the fall or something. Uh, what what, what is the politics of, of this move? Why, why is he kind of presenting New England that way in the context of what's going on in the late 17th century? Is he trying to do that? I mean, people live longer here, just like the uh, army or the patriarchs, or, I don't know. Yeah, well, it's difficult for me to say. I mean, one of the things that makes it difficult is that I don't know exactly when he encounters Greg. I know when he starts popping up, in the source, I mean, I haven't, nor have I read all of Mather's works, so I don't even know when he starts using them exactly. As far as I can figure out, it's in the 17, late 1700s or early 1700s. Um, and I think that, but the other thing I should say is I'm kind of an interloper in, in, in the colonial world right now. I would say that it's, it, there's, there's clearly an attempt to position New England as something different, something apart, something um, perhaps naturally but also morally, at least in an ideal way, separate from the kind of world that Grant is describing, which is associated with London, which is even within the context of England is about the worst place mm -hmm. to be, demographically speaking. Um, so there's a sense in which there's a kind of continuum between what Mather's doing there and what political arithmeticians in England itself are doing in comparing urban environments and urban mortality with rural mortality, which is explicitly compared uh, to the primeval state, even in an English context. So there's a kind of, I guess there's a sense in which New England is, is, is even more so, even closer to the primeval state. But yeah, there are anxiety about the expansion of the Anglican Church, maybe. Um, there are all sorts of potential reasons why. It's He doesn't come out and Ezra Stiles in a later generation will, will come out with similar, much more precise and much more his own observations of population throughout the colonies and will link those observations explicitly to a policy. We need to expand it to Canada because this is the rate at which we're doubling and providentially this is what we're supposed to do, let's do it. Mather doesn't quite make that step. So, and I think it, it may in part be an, an artifact of the very, very a specific context in which he deploys the life table and the fact that they're not they're not completely consistent. I mean as I was saying the way he uses it when he's talking to New Englanders is not the same way that he used it. But he's needing for he for biblical chronology to work, right? Sorry? He needs New England, the evidence from New England 
to defend you with your I think it corroborates a, a view right. that he already had. But I should say, I mean, in no regard is his use of political arithmetic to defend biblical chronology unique. Grant does it. I mean, in the observations themselves. He has a chapter on the multiplication, well, he doesn't call it this, Pentecostalist, but he has a chapter on the multiplication of mankind, which basically says, we can see from the rate at which populations double that the earth need be no older than um, Scaliger makes it. I don't remember what the exact figure is. But, so that, that, there's plenty of precedent there. He's being entirely derivative when he does that. Where he's new is that he thinks New English anecdotes corroborate this, hmm. but that they also complicate the position that, of the colony. I mean, it seems like you, you were arguing that and correct me if I'm wrong, that, that if you have, if, if you were to have grants from calculations, the, the, the number of people on Earth should double what I actually have. So you need longevity at the beginning for this to work, and New England would be the example of that longevity. I think New England is, a, the role that New England seems to be playing, and I'm dealing with scraps here, but the, the role that it seems to be playing is an observable instance of something that was once general, an observable, rare, but not preternatural, not as rare as these prodigies are in Europe, of something that was presumably once the norm. I have a long list, so I'm going to Elizabeth. Yeah, um, this is a question for Ted. I was really intrigued at the end when you were talking about the use of numbers and quantification to justify smallpox, the, the inoculation, and that mm -hmm. being providential intervention, so this idea of mm -hmm. interventions being providential. And it was making me think of yesterday the talk that we had about the Heartlet Circle. Mm -hmm. um, and Henry Carl's paper talking about this mix of spiritualism, religion, commerce, and, and improvement. And I'm wondering if you see that 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 being as something that's moving into into a cosmetic. There's some kind of genealogy there, or spiritual genealogy, or any any kind of connections between sort of what's going on in the mid-century in England and then later in the Americas. Well. Um... I think in a, in, a, in a general sense, yes. In fact, Petty, one of Petty's own works was sent among you know, the box of other hard Libyan stuff to, um, I think, to increase matter way back when. So it's possible that uh, Cotton even encountered Petty that way. I'm not, I guess I'm not confident the way he thinks about his duty towards population is quite the same way that Petty, or that someone like um, take a heart, take Gabriel Platts, who's a you know utopian, and, uh, and talks about the expansion of population in this uh, his work. I think it's the work on agricultural improvement, where he says you know several times already the Earth's population has grown so fast that it's pushed against resources, it's pushed against what what the land can support. And each of those times there's been some invention or some improvement that has enabled the Earth then to you know, accommodate double what it could before. Why he says double, I don't know. I don't think he means that specifically. But he's arguing then that improvements, you know, if undertaken by Parliament, could enable him to do the same. I think that's, there's a vision there of, 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 a, of a history of population which is tied very closely to technological change, which is itself tied very closely to spiritual improvements. I'm not sure that Mather has it that worked out. I mean, I think that he's, I, th I honestly think he's, he's, he sees his, his responsibility towards these numbers as part of his responsibility towards his flock um, and protecting them where he can, warning them where he can, instructing them where he can. But I'm not sure that, that he's grafting onto that some vision that involves, you know, systematically increasing deployments of technology, for instance. I think inoculation is a happy discovery, but he thinks it's an African discovery. Uh -huh. He doesn't think that it's, you know, something that, that you know, Puritans have, have come upon by being Puritans. So. so it's much more just a kind of pastoral? I think so. I think so. I mean, he, I, I don't think that what he's doing is just crystallizing everything that's going on in England, but we don't see it. I think there are genuine differences, but I also think it does clarify some things that are going on, you know, in the metropole that are harder to see. Yeah, thank you. I have a question for Joyce. Um, I think this is a great job, and I was doing some
we've been seeing that there will be nervousness trying to work, uh. um, work on sources and uh, to manage it so to use. So to try to find the kind of books that do not use, I looked at the catalog of all of books at the University of Edinburgh Library. So I don't know if in the Cambridge University Library there might be a catalog of borrowed books like with the signature of Montes. <laughs> 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 I found it in, in Edinburgh, so I guess that yeah. it was common at the time to have a list of who borrowed which book and an idea. And I had a question, and I was wondering if you had time to look into uh, what kind of views made of the history of America. Uh, did he just rely on what Robinson said, um, or he was mm. kind of more critical? Because the reaction to uh, Robinson's America is it was very, uh, you know, mm. it was a dispute in a way. So mm. I was wondering mm -hmm. how Malthus reacted. He doesn't actually um, assess anybody in that way. Um, he derives evidence from them that he incorporates into his account without really um, doing a yes but um, analysis. Um, so, and he uses uh, another thing I think necessary to understand um, his account that I don't really have grips on yet is where he cites Roberts and where he doesn't because it's very selective in and of itself anyway. Um, about the books, um, you know, there is this keeper of the Malthus stuff in Cambridge, and um, we've been in correspondence, and there's no indication that the situation is going to get any better. Um, uh, check addicts in England, you know, <laughs> please, everyone is delegated. Um, um, the problem also is that when Malthus wrote his 1798 and then 1803 um, iterations, he was kind of between institutions. So he had left Cambridge, he had a parish. Um, he wasn't yet at Haley Burley College. So it's hard um, to say either that Cambridge or the East India Company Library would have been available to him. I mean, the latter not. Um, and the former, it's not clear, given where he was at the point, that we can assume anything um, about the resources that might have been there at the time. Uh, so I have uh, two questions for Joyce. One is historical and one is more methodological. My historical question is just to what degree is Malthus's reading of Franklin being inflected through um, sort of several turns of conversation going on within Britain that has already invoked Franklin's writings, mm -hmm. particularly around the moment of the revolution. I know Richard Price yes. kind of invokes Franklin, so mm -hmm. there's already a sense of the kind of um, rapid growth of the United mm -hmm. of the North American colonies as a kind of political factor mm -hmm. needs to be wrestled with before Malthus. So my methodological question has to do um, with the method of counting citations <laughs> and treating them all as equivalent data points. Mm -hmm. And I'm a little, I'll admit a little, a, a fair amount of skepticism about it. Um, and it's particularly because I think there's, you know, in any kind of scholarly work, not all citations are the same, mm -hmm. right? And you can cite something that you are citing because you don't really agree with it. You can cite something that you cite because it has incredible sort of significance in framing the conversation that you're applying to. Or you can cite something as a sort of source of data. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just sort of wondering, you know, what are the potential kind of problems of, you know, can you really treat each one of these different books mm -hmm. exactly? Mm -hmm equally in doing a kind of statistical analysis. Okay, so first about the circulation of Franklin, absolutely. And it's interesting, in the 1798 edition of uh, Malthus's essay, he cites price um, on reversionary payments. Um, but he's, in a sense, he's giving a quotation of a quotation. I warn my students about doing this all the time, but that's what he does, um, and doesn't attribute it to Franklin. Um, it's only in the 1803 edition that, in the meantime, he's figured out, oh, uh, the original source for that was Franklin, and that's where he gets a lot more um, by going back to the original essay. And he uses an edition of Franklin. Um, this is kind of, uh, it still strikes me as incredible that during the Revolutionary War, an edition of Franklin's essays um, was published in London. Um, beginning, it opens with that essay on population, so his most aggressive statement uh, about American power vis-a-vis um, -vis the British. Um, nevertheless, uh, he is a man of science and his works have a kind of international standing. So there, ha there is a lot of discussion and circulation 
of precisely this work. Um, I think by the time Malthus picks it up, however, in a sense that, that doubling every 20 years statistic has, is so famous, it's disassociated from Franklin. Uh, this is what every author does and doesn't want. Um, you know, it's so famous, um, it has, it's taken on a life of its own. So that's definitely the way Malthus originally comes to it, disassoci disassociated with, from Franklin, but then in the meantime, he figures out this is the, the, the real source he needs to analyze in order to figure out um, what new world populations are doing. In terms of the citations, the other thing I'm doing is looking at the frequency uh, with which the individual citations are given. Um, so that's still, um, this is all very interesting as a mode of analysis. It's also incredibly tedious. Um, so I'm not done with that. But that is the other thing I want to look at. Um, and uh, the preliminary finding is that the Jesuits get a lot of play. He goes back and back and back um, very frequently. And that, that's interesting because they're not, they're not example of the settler participant in the way that um, married men Franklin and um, semi-married men Collins are, but they are long settled um, in, in a way that is a, a prototype um, within Catholic celibacy um, of precisely the thing that interests Malthus. So the Jesuits are an early example of that, that kind of almost settled perspective that he seems to think is important. We are one more question, or quick. very quick. You are. I'm sorry. I have people in queue, but calls were answered in the order they were received. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is continuing to get onto this discussion we're all having as we look at you know the, this wonderful region that's brought up Malthus and I mean, Anne and I were just kind of briefly talking about this issue of the, the you know there's now a, a number of studies right about whether it's about the encyclopedia's use of 17th century sources or mm. one that Mark Peterson and his students did that I think have not published about the Mather Library you know the, how the how much the 18th century is reading the 17th century, right, in both instances. So in that respect, again, I think, you know, I'm echoing the general point that this is not a surprising pattern, but it seems to me it's also one that, that you know, separate from all of these, you know, the, the, the issues of the tedium of kind of getting the citation practices right in a quantitative way, that it, it, this also is an opportunity, as you've begun to do, to really reflect on the uses of travel writing as sources of information. And, and it seems to me that, that one of the, you know, two of the basic points that you've made here, you know, could be developed further. So one is that travel writing is historic, right? And so in that, just as travel writers always read the previous travel writers, it is often historic information. And it is also the information of travel liars who may or may not be subject to the kind of critical analysis that you know, the book reviews you cited do by the person who has them in the library because it is part of the way in which travel literature is in whatever library, it's in her library is plural most likely for Malthus and, and his mobility across these things. But, um, and so, so it, that seems to be one of the things that, that has really struck me about this. And the other one is also this issue of, that you've again offered us in the way you divided up the information about how the information about certain parts of the world crystallizes and in which kinds of publications, mm -hmm. right? That there's also a sort of, a part of the historic nature is there's a moment at which people, you know, a book that becomes uh, canonical, separate from the ones that are sort of randomly there, but lock and tilt, for instance, become, mm -hmm. becomes canonical. Mm -hmm. You know, or Franklin, right? You know, is there, and that almost creates the center of gravity itself. You know, that there's no need to necessarily interrogate that. You know, I mean, I, I wonder if there isn't also a sort of implicit sort of reading patterns that could be brought out about where he feels he needs the most up-to-date information. Of course, Pacific, of course, right? Where, but maybe there are some other places as you develop this further that include the aspects of the Jesuit letters too, which are also interestingly yeah. not the 17th century ones, but the most recent. Yeah you know, as well. So in a way, there's, there's a lovely sort of issue about the chronology that, that invites a set of questions that will probably be answered best from what you're saying about really working through, you know, what he's doing with the sources now that you're beginning to assemble the list. But it's, I mean, it's a marvelous case study of this issue of reading practices, right? Mm. You know, and citation practices. Well, thank you. I, and uh, thank you for also bringing up the sense of chronology that I do want to emphasize, that I think he's moving from a world where you did this kind of reading to the world of Haley Burley College, where you're training people to go out and gather the latest, the freshest information. Exactly. So then this is the launching point for that next step. Yeah, right? yeah. So he should, in some ways, you could say he should be more aware that he's moving toward that world. But he's, a lot of his analysis is an artifact of this older way of looking at the world, definitely. Thank you. And on that note, can we thank our two wonderful panelists?